everybody. Sorry to be a minute late that my last meeting just ran over. Annalisa, do we have everybody? Um, I think we have the majority. Let's go ahead and get started. And you can get started with um, attendance. So we'll absolutely know. Uh, remind you as you start that uh, Molly Nolette is not going to be with us today and Mark Siegel won't be with us for the first hour. So um, just go ahead and start attendance. Great. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board. And I want to welcome all of you and the participants. And we are calling this meeting to order. And here comes my virtual gavel. Did you hear that? <laughs> um, first, I'd like to do a roll call of the board. Uh, Lois Cook. I'm here. Thank you. John Doyle. I'm here. Great. Bianca Frogner. Sonia Kellen. I'm here. Hi there, Pam McEwen. She will be joining because we were just on the same uh, meeting, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and yes, Molly Millette is missing Mark. Siegel's joining later. Or do we, we don't have Mark for the first part. We don't have him for the first hour. He'll be in at 10. Oh, great, we'll note that. And when Mark joins, we will also highlight that. Margaret Stanley, I think I saw you. Margaret, if you're here, can you come off mute and tell us that you're present? I am off mute. Oh, we hear you now. Kim Wallace? Yes, here. Thank you. Carol Wilms? Here. Good morning. Hi there. Edwin Wong? I'm here. Great. And Laura Kate Zeichen? Here. Hi. Did I miss anybody? All right. Well, welcome back. Everybody, we have a very long meeting today and lots of recommendations to make. So keep your seatbelts fastened. We're gonna be moving quickly. Um, as you all have heard, and boy, do we feel it, legislative session has ended with lots of additional work for um, the healthcare authority and for the state as a whole, and even some new work for our board. So I remind you, um, of our significant responsibility on this issue of affordability and total costs of care. Senate Bill 5377 got signed yesterday. The bill makes several changes around public option plans. It strengthens our state's ability to contract with hospitals and created state subsidy for plans on the exchange. The board has been assigned a report to the legislature. Once enrollment in public option plans reached 10,000, We'll report on how consumers are impacted by the differences between the public option plans and other plans they can buy. Um, we will compare benefits, premiums, and out-of-pocket costs from the consumer's perspective. So this really serves as a reminder um, that you have a role in this public option path um, that our state is on. And I remind you, we're the only state in the nation right now that are on that path. There are three right behind us, though. Um, but don't worry, we've got a lot on our plate right now. And as you all probably know, the public option only sold about, about around 2,000 um, plans. Uh, so we have got some time till we get to that enrollment of 10,000. That doesn't give us um, any breathing room for what we got to get done though right now. Um, but I think the fact that the legislature put our name on the report is pretty darn interesting. Uh, it tells me that this board is viewed as bipartisan, objective, trustworthy, um, a great source of data and analysis, and all these are really good things. It also tells me that the most important thing we can do is to stay focused on the goals of this work and do the best we can. Um, this is an ongoing evolving environment that we're working in, and I remind you, we're uh, part of a, only eight states in the country that are really on this path. So we need to put all our decisions in the context of this board's um, purpose and the scope of our efforts. I'm thinking about the conversation we had last month about whether to include dental. And being a nurse, um, I bet you know that I believe dental is really important to overall health and it should be integrated into whole person care just as we are working on integrating behavioral health. But we also have to, again, put all those decisions in the context of our full purpose and the scope of our efforts. 
The work of this board is a market-wide intervention on cost inflation. Nobody in our state is doing this work or can do this work. And the decisions we make will have a dramatic impact the entire, to the entire healthcare ecosystem. From that perspective, um, as Michael told us last month, dental is a small slice of the spending pie. Um, that's not gonna hugely impact either our total healthcare expenditure or the percentage of growth. So while I care a lot about dental, we need to stay focused on the higher level goal and put some of those other issues in a parking lot for the future. Doesn't mean we're not gonna get to them. It just means that right now, they aren't gonna give us as much, uh, as I say, a juice for the squeeze. I wanna remind you about the process of working with um, uh, all the partners. And I think it's gonna be exciting as we expand our committees and we're going to uh, discuss membership in them today in these advisory committees. I'm really heartened by all the broad participation and interest that we've gotten for the committees. And I'm sure they're gonna be eager, those committees are gonna be eager to review the recommendations we're making today, um, but not as eager as I am to get their feedback. Um, we've been really intentional about the committees and rounding out the composition of the members. I wanna remind you about the process of working with the committees. The board is gonna make the initial recommendations. Those recommendations will be shared with the committee They'll get a summary of our conversation and they can watch our discussions on the recordings as well. And only after we have the opportunity to review and discuss the committee feedback on a recommendation will we make a final decision. So it's a long um, meeting today uh, and I'll stop here because um, we wanna launch into that work. I remind you we have a break and I do encourage you to stand up, stretch, um, refresh your drinks uh, as you need to. I bought my cup of coffee right here. It's <laughs> close by. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Annalisa because she's going to lead us through our approval of minutes. Annalisa? Oh, great. Thank you, Sue. I am going to the minutes. So um, I'm sure all of you had a chance to review the minutes of the April meeting. Um, if there's no discussion, um, if, is there any discussion of them? If not, I'll ask Sue to call a vote to approve. Any discussion? Okay, Sue, will you call a vote to approve the minutes, please? You bet. Um, seeing that there's no further discussion, is there a vote to approve? Aye. A, a motion, great. Margaret, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, and all those in favor say aye. Oh, aye. I, needed, I guess I needed a second, huh? No second. Thank you, Lois or Carol. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any say nay. I promise my coffee. Okay, that passes. I promise my coffee will sink in the deeper we um, get into this meeting. I apologize. That Robert and his complicated rules. What can we do? <laughs> Um, so great. We'll just move on to the next. Thank you for approving the minutes. We'll move on to the next uh, agenda item, which is um, a selection of a non voting member from the Advisory Committee of Healthcare Providers and Carriers. Now, you know that we um, uh, we are required to have a non voting member on this board. Of course, we're delighted to have them. Um, I asked for uh, volunteers from the current provider and carrier committee, in part because this is a significant additional responsibility. There's quite a few more meetings. There's a lot of material to consider. These are the two individuals up on the screen now, Bob Crittenden and Jody Joyce, who indicated their um, interest in participating with you on this board. Um, so, uh, we can have discussion about it. Um, Sue, would you like to ask if there's any discussion? And um... Yeah, so I um, would ask board members if um, you'd like to talk about these two candidates at this point. If not, we have reviewed both um, of their um, resumes and Annalisa, I think we are suggesting at this point that Jody Joyce be um, named as our non-voting member of the board. 
Yes, see, that was that was um, our staff recommendation, largely because um, certainly both of these individuals are high caliber, and we're delighted to have them both on the provider and carrier committee. Um, Jody is um, currently active in um, in the day to day operations as CEO of Unity Care, in a way that I think might might benefit this board in terms of having some feedback about what it looks like from the perspective of a major market participant. So uh, really that's it, just current employment status and um, familiarity with you know, the operational issues. Of course, Bob is a physician and consultant and highly regarded, but our, our recommendation was Jody Joyce. So with that recommendation, is there any further discussion by board members? If not, no. Oh, I was just going to say you can entertain a motion then if there's good. no if, if not, I um, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation of Jody Joyce as our non-voting board member? I'll, I'll make that motion. Second. second. I will second. Great. Thank you, John and Lois, for the second. <clears throat> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Are, there, are, are there any opposed? Okay, so that passes unanimously. Jody Joyce will be invited to join as a non-voting member of the board. Wonderful, yeah. thank you. Annalisa, what's up next? Um, next, we're gonna talk about some additional members of the Advisory Committee of Healthcare Providers and Carriers. So this is, um, you'll see all the current members on the top. And underneath, we have some additional members for your consideration. Um, the staff is recommending that you approve these members. Um, if you'll recall, we had some conversation at the last meeting about potential gaps in representation on the provider and carrier committee. Um, so we have sought um, additional um, MCO and insurance participation. You'll see Stacy Kessel from Community Health Plan of Washington, Wes Waters from Molina, um, uh, Paul Fishman is a, a prominent economist from the University of Washington, and many of you are familiar with Dorothy Teeter. Um, in particular, we're interested in her as being, um, as dedicating herself, although she has a wide variety of skills, to being a consumer advocate, somebody who is no longer specifically in, uh, engaged in professional market activities, but has certainly a long history of consumer advocacy. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, we, we sent you the materials about these people, um, about these candidates, and would recommend that all of them be added to the committee. So would you ask if there's any discussion or if people wanna talk about the recommendation? You bet. So board, um, any further discussion? Um, I would only say for to Sue and Annalise, and you know this already, that I think Dorothy will do a mighty job of you know, advocating for consumers, but. I worked with her at Group Health for many years, and no, she knows a huge amount of, about health spending. And she will she, she will definitely be doing double duty on your board, on the committee. Yeah, correct. That's great. Thanks for that feedback, Pam. Any others? All right. If not, do I have a motion to approve these additional members to the advisory committee of the healthcare providers and carriers? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Great, thank you. I'm not sure who that came from. That Margaret. Margaret. <laughs> okay, thank you. I love how we have doubles. Um, all right, I'm calling for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that vote passes unanimously. We have rounded out our advisory committee of healthcare providers and carriers. All right. Great. Um, next, boy, we are we are cooking with gas today, people. This is wonderful. Next, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our colleague JB Fisher, who's going to talk to us about the advisory committee on data issues, because that's what's coming next. We need to get get those experts going. So I'm turning it to the slide um, for the advisory committee on data issues, and I'm going to turn it over to JB, who will be facilitating that committee in much the same way I facilitate the provider and carrier committee. Good morning, JD. All right, thanks Annalisa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so just first off a quick introduction of myself. My name is JD Fisher. 
I'm the value-based purchasing manager in the policy division here at the Healthcare Authority. And I'm supporting Annalisa and team uh, in developing all the material for the board. And I will be facilitating the meetings of the advisory committee, uh, committee on data issues to try to lighten the load on Annalisa's shoulders, spread the wealth a little bit. Uh, so a little bit about this advisory committee. It's somewhat unique to other states in their efforts around cost transparency, and there isn't really a board like this. So there's an opportunity for us here in Washington to really leverage this group of experts as we go down this road and uh, build the relationship and kind of shape it the way you would like. Um, the legislation requires that this committee have expertise in health data collection, and reporting, healthcare claims data analysis, economic analysis, and actuarial analysis. And this committee will uh, serve the board to provide input on uh, you know, just about all of its op, uh, goals and objectives, but particularly around the data use strategy and the goals and activities thereof, um, and really inform the analytic approach towards the uh, cost benchmark. So we did uh, a public call for interested individuals to submit material supporting their interest and their role as a prospective member of the committee. We've gotten some recommendations from others about folks to be on this committee. And I believe this list has been shared, but I wanna call your attention to the third name on the list, which is a recent addition that may not have been in the list you've seen prior. Allison Bailey, the Executive Director for Revenue Strategy and Analysis at MultiCare. Um, she is interested in participating and was a, a, an addition earlier this week. So I wanna make sure you see her on this list. So I've tried to compile a list of prospective members that comprise a, a varied and well-rounded background representation and expertise. Uh, and think this is a group, good group. It is quite large, but I remember that this group is just a sounding board and, and a place to get recommendations and input, uh, not necessarily needing consensus voting. So um, yeah, I, I don't have anything else to add. Annalisa, Sue, if you wanna take it away from there. Yeah, so, um, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sue. So JD, thank you. I think, again, this is a really well-rounded list and I remind the board that as people uh, present or if we felt in the future, we are missing any um, contingents or others we can add to them, but I think this is a great start. May I ask oh, I could wait for discussion or I could um, ask a question. Go ahead, Kim. Um, I just, uh, I'm not, uh, of course, asking for, for names <laughs> or naming names, but I guess I just wanted to understand if there were additional applicants um, at folks who uh, expressed interest and volunteered, um, but were not selected. Um, and if, if that's the case, I'm just curious how many there were so that I understand kind of the context of arriving at this group. Uh, sure, Kim, I'll take that one. Actually, um, we were in the unusual position in that every applicant appeared to have high qualification and um, and fill a different niche. So this is actually everyone that applied. There was not a clinker in the bunch. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that well said. I I, I, I assumed so uh, because this type of work, you know, one would not just casually, you know, throw their hat in the ring. <laughs> and, and it does explain why the group is so large. They're just, you know, it just continued to be more experts that we felt that would benefit you that we couldn't turn away. So. Um, JD is going to wrangle this group very well, but it is large. Thank you. And Kim, it, uh, truth be told, we did uh, reach out to some to say, hey, we would like to round this out. So we encourage folks to um, look at this and consider. Uh, this is Margaret. Uh, the only concern I would have is that there's only one actuary in the group and that's from the insurance commissioner's office. And uh, with this kind of work, I think it would be desirable to have another one, uh, if that's feasible, particularly Milliman with their extensive database. 
We have um, embarked on getting a Milliman representative on board, and I don't know where we are at with that. We will check on that. Thank you for that comment, Margaret. Mm -hmm. This is Edwin. Uh, just one comment. That I agree. I think this is very well rounded um, and sort of hits upon the areas of expertise being desired. I think one potential addition that's not apparent is maybe some expertise in Medicare claims data, since that's going to be one component of our um, we use it for our benchmark. And it might already be included in here, but I think this is a consideration for um, additional members. Edwin, um, that's great. And we can follow up with you after if you have any particular names that you would want to um, forward to us that we could reach out. Okay, That'd be great. Thanks. And Ed, this is Bianca. Um, Edwin, I'm, I'm actually curious. I, I was looking at Josh Liao's uh, background. And uh, I, I mean, I know I do know him. Um, but uh, he does talk about his use of Medicare claims data. Uh, you may want to just kind of relook over his background. I, I'm not as familiar about his detailed use of it, but um, I, he does at least talk about it. Um, my yeah. uh, my only other uh, comment I, I'd like to also bring up, and I do want to just bring attention to, is another colleague that I do know is Jerome Duggan, and I think he's an excellent colleague, uh, and glad to see that he's on here, and he, he's a health economist and. Well, I know you're looking for a, and, and maybe another actuary. He may also bring some of that um, knowledge about databases, kind of similar to what Josh may also bring. Um, but I know he will also bring a lens on issues around health equity. And I didn't get a chance to look at some of the other folks on the list as much in detail. And I'm just wanting to make sure that we have good representation around thinking about issues of health equity and how we look at data uh, for different kinds of communities. Um, and I just, without really looking carefully, I just um, just want to raise that as a, a point in thinking about members. Thank you for that comment. I think Jerome will also bring that bring good lens too. I, just, I do want to stress that he would bring some of that too. I just don't want him to be the lone voice on that, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and I have to say, working with Dave Mancuso and actually a number of the healthcare authority folks, we deal with a lot of the Medicare data as well, too, with um, all the work that we do with duels. And I know Megan Atkinson is on and shaking her head as well. So um, I do feel like we, we are very comfortable in that space because we use that Medicare information so much as well. Megan, did you want to comment? I didn't, I didn't know if it was appropriate to, but yeah, I would just say, I believe RDA maintains um, an annual set of Medicare data. And so I think um, Dr. Mancuso has quite a bit of experience in that space. I think he'll um, bring that expertise to the group. Other comments from the board? All right, I don't see any further discussion. So I'm gonna go, and I'm going to ask for a motion to approve. So move. Thank you, Margaret. Is there a second? Second, Lois Cook. Great, thank you, Lois. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Aye. Hearing no opposition, uh, this passes unanimously. And um, Annalisa and JD, you've got your advisory committee members to begin to convene. Thank you. That's wonderful. We're very excited about that. Um, and uh, again, very well done, board. Expeditious, moving through it. So now we are going to turn to probably a good good time to just take a little stretch like this because we're gonna. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. January will share hers, and we will move into a presentation beginning with the recap of preliminary recommendations. So January, I'll stop sharing my. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay, I've started sharing mine, so you might already be seeing that. <laughs> oh, well, there uh, you go. We all right. See it. Okay, great. Um, so uh, at the last board meeting, we uh, talked about exactly what it is that we're trying to measure and um, assess in relation to the cost growth benchmark. And uh, we presented you with information about how HB 2457 and um, how other cost growth benchmark states define total healthcare expenditures. Um, 
there was general consensus that uh, total healthcare expenditure should be defined as the, the sum of the allowed amount of claims paid by insurers to providers, um, the all non-claims-based payments from insurers to providers, and the net cost of private health insurance. And um, defining it this way allows us to capture insurer payments, uh, consumer out-of-pocket costs, um, and administrative costs. And um, there, there was recognition that out-of-pocket spending by consumers on non-covered services would not be included. And um, this limitation is due really to the fact that there, there aren't really good sources of data to capture that spending. Um, we talked about pharmacy rebates and um, the legislation was silent on whether or not to report spending um, with, or, you know, with or without rebates. And the recommendation from the board was that spending should be reported net of pharmacy rebates, uh, which can be quite substantial. And then uh, the board also recommended that total medical expense um, should include dental and vision services only when they're covered under a comprehensive medical benefit. And um, uh, as Sue has alluded to, there was a fairly robust discussion about dental services in particular. Um, and there was a desire to capture dental services beyond what's paid for under a, a comprehensive medical benefit, but also recognition that this would require um, a separate data call to dental only carriers, which would add to the administrative resources required to run the cost growth benchmark program. Um, so uh, the, the issue of waiver services also came up and in particular, Washington has a lot of uh, Medicare, uh, sorry, not Medicare, Medicaid waiver services. And um, there were questions about whether this would be included in the calculation of total healthcare expenditures. And we noted that yes, um, these would be included and the board recommended that project staff ensure that these services are appropriately captured um, in the different service categories used by other cost growth benchmark um, states uh, that are reporting spending. And then um, in general, there was a desire by members of the board to be as comprehensive as possible in defining healthcare spending for, for the purposes of measuring performance against the benchmark. Um, but, but that desire is, is somewhat kind of balanced by, by the reality that some spending that the board wishes to capture um, are just hard to get at. Um, and so uh, the board wanted um, the final recommendations report to reflect this general desire uh, to be as comprehensive as possible and to indicate that um, in particular, that the board may wish to revisit the de definition of total healthcare expenditures um, uh, in the future to include payments made by standalone dental plans uh, should that data become available and accessible. So that's a, a recap of um, last month's discussion and kind of uh, preliminary recommendations. Um, does this sound right to you? Um, are there any kind of modifications or additions that you might make to that? Henry, thank you for that synopsis. Um, board members, any discussion or questions of these preliminary recommendations? All right, well, hearing okay. none, Jen, oops, I'm sorry, was there somebody jumping in? No, that was me, just uh, basically going where you were going. So hearing uh, no other comments, no comments on that, I'll move forward to what we're gonna cover for today's discussion. Um, we are gonna continue our discussion of design decisions and recommendations. Um, you know, last month we went through what it is that we're measuring. Um, today, the first design recommendation that we're gonna tackle is about whose costs we're measuring. Um, and then after that, we'll start talking about the benchmark methodology, um, starting first with uh, establishing criteria for selecting an economic indicator. Um, we, we have some options for economic indicators that we will present. Um, and for each of these indicators, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk to you about what it means um, if you peg the benchmark to that indicator and um, also provide some information on what historical growth for each of these indicators has been. 
we'll compare the different indicators and their relative advantages and disadvantages. Um, we'll also talk about um, whether to use historical versus forecast data to calculate um, the actual value that the benchmark might be um, based on. And then uh, we will present you with um, values that we calculated um, using both historical and, and forecasted data. Um, so uh, this is this is a lot of um, information to cover. I think we uh, are, I think our board book has something upwards of seventy or so slides. Um, and I just want to kind of um, preface our our presentation that uh, with um, the recognition that you know. We, we fully expect that we're not, uh, we may not end today's meeting with a recommendation on our benchmark value. We did plan to, to have um, this, this discussion over um, two meetings. So we will get through as much as we can today. And then whatever we don't get to today, we'll cover in the June meeting. But you know, this is all to say that we, um, we realize that this is a lot of material to digest and to talk through and to think through. And um, we want to make sure that we're not shortchanging that discussion. And so um, we, we think that we'll use this, this meeting and next meeting to kind of um, come up with um, the recommendations. Uh, before I move on, um, does anybody have any questions about what we're going to cover today? OK. All right, so let's move on to the first design recommendation we're going to ask you about, which is defining the population for whom total medical expenses are being measured. Um, <clears throat> HB uh, 2457 didn't uh, specifically define the population um, whose, whose health care spending uh, should be measured. Uh, the, the legislation talked about healthcare expenditures in Washington from public and private sources, and um, also made reference to cost sharing paid by residents of the state. And um, we think that based on this language, it, it looks like the intent is to measure all Washingtonians healthcare spending, but you know, that's, that's sort of easier said than done when it comes down to actually operationalizing it. So we're going to we're going to try to define that population more specifically um, and, and do it um, through the sources of coverage for the population and identifying basically the individuals who receive health care for which uh, spending can be measured. So um, as we did in the last meeting, we are going to walk through the considerations um, so that you can more concretely define this population. Um, uh, one big consideration here um, as we talk about sources of coverage is the availability of data. You know, we, as we already experienced in last meeting in our discussion on dental care, you know, we know that data, um, data access on healthcare spending can be a challenge sometimes. And, you know, in, in some cases, um, states that have wanted to be more comprehensive in their measurement of healthcare costs, um, um, have, have, you know, initially wanted to include as much as possible, but then have had to sort of um, scale, scale that back after doing a little bit of research and finding that the data were hard to get. So, so that's just something to keep in mind as we, um, as we talk about the populations and um, the sources of coverage to include in the measurement. Um, <clears throat> So in this slide, we list um, the, the primary sources of healthcare coverage um, that, that most people have. You know, we have Medicare, uh, fee-for-service and Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, again, fee-for-service and managed care. And then there are people who are eligible for both uh, Medicare and Medicaid and receive their coverage through an integrated plan. And then there's commercial coverage, um, both the fully, uh, uh, fully insured and, and self-insured. And um, when people talk about public and private sources of coverage, um, uh, there, there's generally broad agreement um, that 
includes these sources of coverage. Um, and, and all cost growth benchmark states include spending on individuals who get their health care from these sources um, in, in their measurement of total medical expense. And um, in Washington, if you capture the population who get their care through uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurance, we think that you're, you're capturing about 90% of um, state residents. So um, we sort of assume that it's the intent of HB uh, 2457 to include these sources of coverage. Um, other sources of coverage, which are not quite as straightforward, are um, the Veterans Health Administration, which would be, would be spending by the VA. Um, there's the correctional health system. Uh, so uh, state pays a lot of money for the healthcare of individuals who are incarcerated. Um, and some of this is captured in Medicaid um, uh, when, when an incarcerated uh, person is hospitalized, but a lot of spending is not. Um, and then there's also spending by the, the Indian Health Services. Um, so uh, whereas all cost growth benchmark states include spending on people who get their coverage through Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial plans, um, they've not been consistent when it comes to um, these three sources of coverage. They vary on whether or not to include VA, the correctional health system, or IHS. And so um, we're going to talk through how you might want to approach um, each of these. Okay, and let's start with the Veterans Health Administration. And so- January, may I ask, yeah. a, may I ask a question first? Please. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, about uh, workers' compensation medical services. Uh, I'm not sure where those are captured and if other states are across the board, including them, there are uh, you know, 600 to $800 million a year um, spent actually under workers' compensation industrial insurance. And so mm -hmm. just um, you know, thought I would raise that and see if we are explicitly including that or perhaps that's an addition. Yes, that's a really good question. Um, uh, to my knowledge, um, none of the cost growth benchmark states have included workers' compensation. Um, I think there's been some discussion at, at the state level on, on whether or not to include these. And Michael, um, or, or can you weigh Actually, in on what the discussions have been? I don't know if any other state has ever raised it, Kim. I mean, it's, it seems sort of obvious when you raise it, but I don't think it's surfaced in any other states. Um, if it was included, it would, and this is true for these three categories you see on this slide as well, would have to be included um, at a, um, a state level. You wouldn't be um, bringing this down to the insurer level for accountability for total cost of care or to the provider level, but it certainly could be included in the big pie. Yeah, I think that it may be um... I'll to make one brief comment about this. It may be that you know Washington's unique position situation as be having a very large state fund. Um, I think there are only two other states actually that that conduct their industrial insurance coverage this way. So, so the state fund in Washington, you know, that's funded by the premiums, employer employee premiums, um, is that six hundred million dollars a year or so. Um, that covers the vast majority of employer payments for workers' comp. And that's essentially a fully insured state fund, essentially. Yeah. It makes it easier to do, right? Because yeah, in other states, insured. you'd have to run after all these individual workers' comp carriers who otherwise are not reporting. Exactly. And in Washington, there are, I don't know, 300 something or other self-insured employers for workers' comp. And there are extra challenges, of course, in accessing that data. But we, we do have potentially you know, a way to get at that data as well. But the state fund is, I just want to say, is quite accessible. What percentage of the market do you think the state fund represents? Well, in terms of spend, a uh, high level estimate would be 600 million of the 800 million per year spent is actually in the state fund. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Um, Okay, so that's we're we're gonna add that to the list uh, for discussion, and then let's talk about um, Veterans Health Administration. Um, you know, this is uh, as I mentioned, spending for individuals who receive their care at VA facilities, 
And you know, the reason for including this is that it would provide a more complete picture of healthcare spending in the state. Um, uh, estimates are that less than 2% of Washington residents have coverage through the military, uh, which includes the VA and TRICARE. Um, we were unable to get a, an estimate of just the VA. So um, if we're counting just the VA, it would be some portion of that 2%. Um, you know, why you might not want to include it is that you, the, the data are limited um, and not directly comparable to the total medical expense data that are um, collected from payers. Um, they don't report by service categories that payers report on. Um, it's also reported on a federal fiscal year basis. So there's some sort of like um, calculation that needs to be done to translate that into a calendar year basis. Um, <clears throat> Massachusetts, um, Delaware, and Connecticut um, include VA spending, and Oregon and Rhode Island do not. Um, and I, you know, I was not part of the conversation, so I'm not sure why, uh, Michael, I wonder if you could weigh in on why Massachusetts, Delaware, and Connecticut include it, and Oregon and Rhode Island don't. Uh, you know, these are sort of funny conversations <laughs> in states, um, and um, the, the dollar amounts associated with each of these categories, as you can see here, as a percentage of total healthcare spending is small. And so I think whether or not a state opts for something or not has to do with how much they value that percentage of spend represented and also the perception of how easy it will be to access the spending. Our experience um, has shown that um, it's possible to get uh, Veterans Health Administration spending um, without too much duress. The state correctional health system is very state specific. Uh, in Connecticut, it was very easy to get it. Uh, one person and one number. <laughs> uh, but that may not be the case in every state. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about the Indian Health Service, by the way, is um, no state has yet accessed spending for the Indian Health Service. And Oregon has stated a desire to do so, but we don't actually have evidence of anyone being successful obtaining that information. Right. Thanks, Michael. Um, so yeah, and just, you know, in the, the Indian Health Services, I think Oregon, as Michael mentioned, um, was looking into capturing that. Um, our understanding based on their research is that um, uh, to do that, they would have, uh, they would need permission from all of the tribes to be able to use that data, um, which, you know, depending on how many tribes are, are in your state would be a, a lot of work. So, um, so there's the VA, there's correctional health system, um, in, let's see, in Washington, um, it's, it's a small segment of the population, 0.2% of the state's overall population. Um, Oregon, Connecticut includes this. Um, Massachusetts, Delaware, and Rhode Island don't. Um, I think we would have to do some research in Washington about how easy or hard it is to collect uh, correctional health spending. Um, if, if this is something that the board um, recommends including. And then um, uh, in terms of IHS spending, um, you know, it, it would be fairly difficult to include, um, but, you know, it, it's sort of uh, um, still, still a consideration for the board. And I just, I just want to also kind of say with relation to, in relation to IHS spending, you know, if, um, if the board decides not to include it, that, you know, that doesn't mean that we're excluding spending on Native Americans um, to the extent that um, Native Americans have Medicaid, Medicare, or commercial coverage, um, their costs will be included in, in those data. So we're really just talking specifically about spending on um, IHS. So, um, before we launch into discussion, you know, I think we want to facilitate a discussion on, on each of these and whether or not you would want to include them. Do you have any questions? 
This is Laura Kate. Michelle's mm -hmm. comment in the chat may have addressed this, but I'm curious if the healthcare authority has done any tribal consultation yet around tribes' interest or willingness to be included in this. I am not familiar. I wonder if anybody and the state staff are able to respond to that. This is Sue and um, Laura Kate. At this point, no, I don't believe we have um, begun consultation on this topic with them. Um, we do, you know, we know that's about 90,000 tribal members, and we have some other work that's going on um, with the tribal members. So we certainly could introduce this, but we have not formally moved into consultation. Well, and if I can add, Sue, we do have Vicki Lowe is, is on your provider and carrier committee. Um, as you know, uh, Vicki has a lot uh, from the American Indian Health Commission. So she, uh, she, she is uh, participating, but um, she and I have had not had a chance to sit down and kind of initiate how she would like us to approach the consultation. So they are aware of the work, but there has, we haven't taken any steps toward a formal consultation. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you could make an inquiry with the Department of Corrections concerning the um, bills that they pay outside the uh, Corrections Department health system. I know they um, refer people out to private providers, and I don't know whether that data would be worth capturing or not. That is definitely something that we can follow up on. Yeah, in, in Connecticut, it was fairly simple because they kind of, they hire their own providers. And so everything they were able, you know, with exception of, of hospitalizations that were paid for by Medicaid, they had all the spending um, uh, for, for um, healthcare for the incarcerated. But we'll, we'll find out, um, we'll dig in deeper into how that, um, how that is in Washington. On the um, on the Indian Health Service question, um, I, don't, I don't know if we're in discussion yet or not. I'm. Yeah, I think it's it's worth launching into the discussion. Okay, all right. I just realized I, would, I was taking us from questions to discussion. Um, I would be um, very interested in Vicki Lowe's opinion about how we handle this issue. Um, I agree; it would be formidable to work with the twenty nine tribes on this, but um, I think because particularly because we have her participation, we should we should seek her opinion. And, and I hope that doesn't create any unnecessary delays. Um, and, and actually just a note on the Indian Health Service spending, that is, um, uh, there's some complexity there also um, in terms of like overlap, with, you know, making sure that we're not double counting Indian Health uh, Service spending versus Medicaid spending that might be captured for Medicaid as well. So that's just um, that's just a, a layer of complication that, that needs to be worked through. Yeah. I just think in this state, it's very important that these issues be handled with just a lot of consideration. Any other comments on any of these? I'm just I just I was going to say, I was just going to add, um, I think from a conceptual perspective, I think we, I, rec recognizing the, the practical issues, I think if there's a way to incorporate all three of these, I would argue for that from a couple of perspectives. I think the first from a health equity and inclusion standpoint, I think these are three um, oftentimes uh, sort of underrepresented subpopulation. I think to the extent that we can capture them and include them, I think we should do that. I think the second point is that having them in the benchmark, I think would support sort of future analyses. If you look at, for example, cost drivers, I think um, cost drivers down the road, we want to look at, for example, you know, differences across payers and, and to look more in more granularity. I think having these in an aggregate benchmark, I think would help the generalizability of some of those more granular analyses down the line. Thanks, Edwin. Any other thoughts? I agree with Edwin, particularly uh, around making sure that these populations are represented in our analysis and consideration. Um, 
And specifically to IHS spending, I just want to second what Pam said. I'd really like to understand um, Vicki Lowe's perspective and any you know additional consultation that can inform the decision of the board. I also am, am in agreement with all of those and think it's uh, very important to <coughs> work on getting that workers comp uh, information included as well. Other comments or discussion points from board members? Right. So what I'm what I'm hearing is a desire to be as comprehensive as possible and um, to the extent that the data can support it, include VA, um, correctional health spending, uh, spending by the IHS um, and, and workers comp. Um, there's some follow up that needs to happen. Uh, to understand how corrections spending is um, is provided and consultation, you know, um, members of the board are interested in hearing uh, Vicky Lowe's perspective on on spending on Indian health services. Um, does that does that summary? The, do members of the board agree with that summary? I do. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, is there other spending? that um, we haven't talked about yet that you might want to um, consider for inclusion. This is that one again, just a subtle point. I think the data sources, I think for the VA and TRICARE might be different. So I think it's DED, so I think TRICARE, so active, active duty members for the civil services, which is um, VA, um, those are, have already been discharged. The system never finds yeah, spending. yeah. So that's that's correct, and that's a point actually. So the VA spending, you know, it, it's literally uh, that, that's data that we get from like a federal website. Um, uh, they provide state by state data and medical care. Again, it's not in the same format, or or you know, it doesn't break down by by spending categories that we think um, uh, in the same way that the spending categories will get. Um, in the same way as the spending categories we'll get from um, the payer data that, that we're gonna have to request. Um, TRICARE, um, you know, uh, I think um, in, in Washington, um, the big TRICARE plan is HealthNet, uh, which is a Centene company. And we think that um, in the request for commercial data, they'll probably be folded into that. So that's, um, we think that they're, uh, that we'll be able to capture that data, although we're not necessarily going to be able to say this, this is what's attributed to TRICARE, you know, TRICARE spending. In the same way that FEHPP, the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program, you know, is the, the, cover, the insurance coverage for um, federal workers, uh, we should be able to capture in the data request for commercial data but we won't necessarily be able to parse out like, you know, of this, of the commercial spend, this is how much is attributed to FEHBP. Does that, um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does, thank you. Okay. I do have one additional question. Um, I'm just thinking uh, about the types of personal health services that may be covered by public health funding. Um, and for example, things like newborn screening, um, other screening testing, um, and uh, WIC, nutrition services, that kind of thing. Um, I, I, this is potentially kind of a reach, but, but thinking comprehensively, um, there are, I believe, you know, certain types of services that are delivered actually to individuals, not just population health interventions, but actually to individuals um, for which there is not a billing to Medicaid um, right. or to a commercial insurer. So I would just ask if that has been considered uh, by other states and you know what context or background you have with regard to um, you know, the possibility of seeking to include those types of expenses. Um, so I, you know, Michael, you may have 
um, some, some context. Um, I don't know if they have been considered in other states, none of the states included, but Michael, do you, do you know if this has been discussed? As before? Nevada recently talked mm -hmm. about this. Uh, it was the first time I've heard it discussed. The extent to which public health pays for direct services varies by state. And so it's not an issue in, in each state. Um, Nevada um, hasn't made a decision on that. Um, I, not, I don't think they're gonna go in that direction, but um, Kim, it would be possible, um, assuming that those, those dollars can be teased out of um, the budget to include that spending. I don't know what the scope of it is and whether it's large enough to be worth the effort to do so. Um, that could be something that we could um, scope with Annalisa following the meeting today. But in general, um, no other state has included public health spending to date. I like where Kim is going with that question um, because I know that we're not, we're, or at least my understanding is that we're not trying to capture um, the spending of those who are, you know, not necessarily covered by a payer that's listed here. Um, so trying to think about, you know, where are those uh, pockets of spending that we can capture uh, around the safety net in particular, I think would be interesting to consider um, if, if it can be teased out um, and collected in, in, in our state. Um, so just something to note as, as we think about, you know, other um, sort of more non-traditional sources of coverage, um, the, the reporting, you know, the level at which they are reported, a lot of these things are really, can only really be reported at the state level, right? It's, it's not going to be possible to attribute them to the provider uh, at the provider level, um, and so, or, or the market level, because market, we only have Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. Um, so it's, it's sort of at the high level state, state reporting. If we have the opportunity to do so, um, I'd really be interested in maybe the provider and payer committee or, or maybe uh, specifically the data advisory committee to weigh in on any other sort of significant or directionally aligned um, areas of spending that maybe we haven't considered and make a recommendation to the board about whether we should or shouldn't consider those. Okay. I like that, Laura Kate. I think that including, you know, for us to make a decision, I like the idea for us to make a decision to at least take a step, you know, in, in direction to understand um, the uh, advisability, the the feasibility, um, and other perspectives. I think is a, would be a really positive step to take. And then, of course, we'll be able to consider whether to, uh, you know, to, uh, to embrace that uh, uh, track, you know, and data sets and things full on or not. Mm -hmm. It seems worthwhile to at least lean in that direction to discover at this point, to discover um, what the possibility of inclusion is. Um, it's, we all know that the medical care system and expenses in the medical care system uh, do have effects and, you know, uh, on, of course, like the safety net, the safety net has to, you know, expands or, or contracts um, in response to, you know, many dynamics and challenges of cost and other things in the, you know, quote unquote, regular medical care system. So it's, it's, there, there are interdependencies and connections that I think it's, worthwhile um, always remembering. Thanks, Kim. Any other thoughts, suggestions? Okay, so let me just kind of recap again what um, where we're at, right? So in terms of sources of coverage to include I think um, you know per per the legislation um, 
um, we would include Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. And then in terms of the other sources of, or other sources of spending, um, uh, we want to include them as, as, as much as possible to the extent that um, the data are available um, and accessible. And we're going to add to this list, um, you know, so we have some homework to do in terms of um, finding out more about the correctional health system spending and Indian health service spending um, and, and, and checking with um, other stakeholders, uh, particularly uh, around the IHS spending. And then we would add to this list um, workers uh, compensation and what am I? Public health. At public health, right. Yes. Personal, we could perhaps refer to it as personal health services and public health system or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, may I ask if the workers' compensation is being added to this list or actually to the previous list, Medicare, Medicaid, commercial insurers, I was thinking workers' compensation was uh, the fourth bullet uh, along with Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurers. Is, did I misunderstand or? There, there's no difference, Kim. It's just, mm -hmm. we put the, the categories in different slides. The first slide indicates oh. the categories that every state uses. And the second category was oh. cyber categories that some states use and some didn't. Yeah. I see. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, um, I just want to add, um, as a member of this board who's still learning a lot, is that we're, our goal is to set a benchmark. So, um, you know, not to understand every dollar we're spending on health care, I believe. So even though we always want to understand that. So I just want to note that. So in the, to the degree that these things are just too difficult to track down or become unwieldy, I, I just presume we will discuss that and take them off the table. Is that correct? Or Pam, that, Sue, that's what I thought was going on. Okay, thanks, Sue. So thank you for punctuating that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, we still have kind of two questions to ask before we get into the benchmark methodology. And that is, you know, um, who should be, what, what should be the residence of the individual whose healthcare spending is being measured and what should be the location of the provider who is providing um, that service, right? So we have, um, we have Washington residents who see uh, Washington providers. And in, that, in this slide, that's represented by the, the top left quadrant in the blue. Um, we sort of assume that's a no-brainer that you, of course, you would want to capture that. Um, I think it's also pretty clear that we would um, want to exclude care provided um, to out-of-state uh, people who, um, who seek uh, care outside of Washington, right? So non-Washington -re non residents who seek care outside of Washington, that's, sort of, that's the bottom right quadrant in the purple. Um, but we kind of have these two groups that are sort of in the middle, right? We don't, um, there's, there are going to be some Washington residents who seek care from out of state providers. Um, they, they may live near the border and want, you know, they may want to get care in Oregon or they've been vacationing in the East Coast and had an, an accident and broke their ankle. Um, um, and so that's the top right quadrant in the green. Um, so we're going to have to talk about that group. And then the reverse is also possible, right? You have um, folks who uh, don't live in Washington, but seek care from Washington providers, which is the bottom left quadrant in the orange. Um, so we're going to need to talk about that group also. Um, so, all right, so let's, let's first talk about Washington residents who receive care from um, out-of-state providers. Um, and, and some considerations around this is that there may be, you know, health systems that have affiliations with physicians or who employ physicians who practice in border states. And so it may be hard for a payer to figure out within a health system which providers practice in Washington and which don't. Um, 
you know, some, some of the people in this group um, may receive care from out-of-state providers on a one-off basis, but, but likely most of them um, probably live in border regions and receive their care from, from out-of-state providers on, on a more routine basis. Um, just something to note is that um, other cost growth benchmark states uh, capture spending data for individuals who reside within their state, uh, regardless of where they got their care. And, and the reason for this is that it would take a lot of effort for an insurer to report um, particular members claims and kind of separate out any claims for services that were incurred um, you know, in Washington versus a different state. So um, on this issue, you know, what, what would the board like to do with this group? Do you want to include healthcare spending on Washington residents that um, were incurred out of state? I would be in favor of that. Okay. I agree. I agree. I agree. Is there anyone who disagrees? I'm just curious how difficult it is to get an out-of-state provider to provide the information if they're not one of the ones that kind of crosses the border. It, does that create issues with gathering the data? So the data are typically um, gathered from payers. The providers themselves don't uh, provide the data. It's, um, and payers gather this from claims. Okay. Um, so they have the data, but sort of parsing it out claim by claim, um, you know, they're going to have to already parse out kind of who among, among my membership, who were residents of Washington versus who are not. And then, and then among resident, my members who are residents of Washington, they would, uh, parsing it out claim by claim can be, I think, quite, uh, laborious. And that, that's, the, that's the feedback we have gotten certainly from um, payers in other states that have done this. Okay. Other questions? No, I think we're in agreement. Okay. About this quadrant that these costs should be captured. Okay, good. All right, so then the other group are people who don't live in Washington, but um, get care from Washington providers, you know, and, and um, uh, other states have typically looked at this and, and discussed this in the context of people who live in other states, but commute into Washington, um, because Washington employers are paying for their health care, and there's a desire to capture that spending. And so again, you know, um, one consideration around this is that, you know, um, the state is likely only to be able to request data from insurers who are licensed in Washington. So to the extent that these individuals are covered by insurers that, that are licensed in their home state, but not in Washington, that data will be hard to get. Um, you know, and then, you know, these are healthcare dollars being spent in Washington, but it's not, um, not spending on behalf of Washington residents. So, you know, uh, because of that, like to how, you know, to what degree should we care about this spending? Um, uh, none of the states in, uh, include this in their measurement. I think Oregon originally wanted to, but um, recently um, determined not to, um, not to include it uh, for uh, various technical reasons, including difficulty around gathering the data. Yeah, January, this is Sue. I can certainly appreciate the difficulty in gathering the data, but I will say it's awfully awkward with Alaska not having um, level one hospitals and flying so many of their clients to Seattle um, in the strain that that creates for um, kind of the academic health center roles that we play in both Seattle and also with um, Washington State University over on the Idaho side, mm -hmm. kind of Pullman. So I just am curious how we could um, try to capture this expense um, because these certainly are, it, it's a constant issue for our state because of the way we're bordered. And even with COVID, we've been monitoring and 
um, assisting with all the transportation and costs in much more of a regional position or, or in a regional role. So, Sue, I would say, um, recall that what we're trying to capture here is spending and not provider costs. Oh, yeah, good point. But doesn't that go into like what they said? I mean, it, isn't that part of how GME and those supplementals are? Well, it, yeah, I mean, care? so there there are some things that influence provider costs and which then, you know, through negotiations may play out in terms of what the spending is. And we're not going to capture them all. I mean, another example are are uh, people who are uninsured. Uh, we're not capturing both their spending and the expenses that are incurred to serve them. Um, so yeah, there's some indirect relationship, but technically speaking, that doesn't represent spending um, in Washington on healthcare services. It's spending in Alaska on healthcare services delivered in Washington. Yeah, I'm following you. I, I yeah, I just I look at our level one influencers. But anyways, if if no one else is doing it and it's not possible, I guess we well, it, stay it's, aligned with the rest of the country. I mean, it's it's possible to some degree. The issue is you'd have to ask. Uh, I don't even know who are the Alaska insurers, but let's say it's Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. You would have to say, pretty please, would you submit data to us so we can measure our healthcare spending? Um, and they, you don't really have anything to compel them to do so. So that, so, but you could ask them. You just have less assurance that they would do so than if you had a Washington licensed carrier. So it would be Primera and United, ostensibly, we would be asking. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. Well, I, I am fine. Th this is not our major issue, but it is a parking lot issue that we might want to examine for the future. I'm curious how others feel about this issue. Well, I think if we focus on the cost burden on the consumer, either directly or through uh, foregone wages, then that will clarify things in our minds about who to include and, and who not to include. I agree that it might be a good issue for the future, for sure. Is there any way to get a sense of the count of people that we're talking about here that we're excluding? Is there any way to get, I know the expenditure piece is going to be difficult, but do we have any sense of how many people, how many claims lines or anything like that, that we would lose? Yeah. I, don't I can think see so. this thing as a kind of more, yeah. I think, I mean, I think the real question is, what's the purpose or the desired purpose of your yeah. cost growth benchmark? And if it is to slow healthcare spending by consumers, taxpayers, and employers in Washington. Um, I'm not sure that including spending that's incurred by non-Washingtonians um, warrants inclusion. If that's yeah, what I mean, I think I can see the issue that Sue is bringing up, which is that there's a spillover effect. I think that's a particular concern. And maybe one thing, I mean, I agree, we should probably revisit this at some point in time. And maybe it's when we look at the actual hospital spend. And if we see that they're having a hard time maybe staying in line, it's kind of unpacking that further that it's maybe because they're taking in so many folks coming from out of state, for example, just maybe that might be a way to keep that as a point of discussion or keep it as a thing in mind that may be contributing to challenges to that sector in particular in, in controlling their spend. I mean, you certainly could track using your all payer claims database. What's the percentage of healthcare um, uh, revenue at hospitals that um, or expenditures to the extent you have in your APCD that's coming from patients who are not state residents and whether that's changing over time. It, it, 
I'm fine parking this issue. It is an issue that comes up with Seattle Children's and Harborview quite a bit because of the outliers, the extensive complexity of these clients and what that does, you know, the toll that creates on the system. But again, I am fine parking this issue. Others? Yeah, I, I agree with parking the issue. I think there's been historically a lot of angst about out-of-state people using our system or there's been stories that have never been backed up that people actually come and obtain residency so that they can use Washington State Healthcare. Um, but I don't know that it helps us set a benchmark, but it, it's probably an issue that needs to be explored in maybe some, some other forum. But can I ask if they establish residency, then they will be captured in here. Would that be right? That is correct. correct. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's yeah. a lot of angst. <laughs> you wouldn't catch those <laughs> <out>. <laughs> Okay. Vishal, you had a comment? Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to add um, just a couple perspectives in support of what you guys have been discussing. Um, We've had an internal conversation about the difference between the total healthcare expenditure, which is spend, versus total cost of care. And I think we need to keep those two things. They're linked, but they're separate. For the total cost of care, it will be imperative that we capture all of it. But from an expenditure or a spend standpoint, um, I like the way I'm hearing the board to say, let's, let's not, maybe not now, but let's not totally lose sight of it. Let's come back at it. In the border communities, especially when we have cross-state employers, um, employer situated in the state of Washington, which has employees across the border. I live in Canada, right across the border from Oregon, so I experience this firsthand. Um, there's there's a lot to be said about trying to capture some of those uh, expenditures, but I think that's something that as we get maturity in how we um, get the data and assimilate it, that we will learn better ways of addressing it in the future. Thank you. When we're complete with this quadrant, I do have a comment about the fourth quadrant that we um, uh, eliminated uh, initially when it's time. Um, I think um, what I hear is sort of general agreement that this is an important issue to track, but that this is something that we uh, that the board may want want to just revisit in the future. Um, so I, I think that we're ready um, and we can talk about the other issue you want to discuss, Kim. Okay, I just wanted to acknowledge with respect to the out of state, out of um, the southeast <laughs> quadrant um, that, uh, you know, PEB retirees and uh, workers compensation are examples of where Washington payers have responsibilities and do have expenditures associated with these people. Um, and so uh, perhaps what we're assuming is that the, the payer reporters will be able to excise from their uh, data set reporting um, or whoever is doing that will be able to appropriately exclude those people. Um, so I just, based on the earlier comments, I just wanted to um, raise that so that for awareness, we have PEB retirees who move out of state and who are covered by and get care from out of state providers who are covered by their PEB retiree benefits. Mm -hmm. And then also in workers' compensation, we have injured workers who move out of state and who are uh, seeing out of state providers for whom we still uh, provide medical care. Okay. Um... So I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not advocating to include this quadrant, but I am following up on the comments made earlier about some of the difficulties and challenges of separating out the data. And so I just wanted to highlight two examples of where uh, payers may in fact run into that. Yes, thank you, Kim. Um, so we'll note that. Um, and uh, any, other, any other thoughts or do, does anybody have any? Comments on that? Okay. Is there, uh, sorry, Kim, is there a desire maybe in the future to track that also or? or? I'm, uh, I don't know at this moment. Mm -hmm. 
it, you know, if I, what my opinion is. Um, uh, my comment, you know, thank you for asking. My comment mostly was just uh, for kind of awareness purposes. And right. so we understand we eliminated that out of hand kind of quickly initially. Okay. And I just wanted to make sure that we understood um, who that, that 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 quadrant does represent people for whom expenditures are being incurred in Washington. Okay. Well, we can certainly make note of that in the recommendations report. Um, and so that is a context that people need, you know, people would um, uh, would consider and, and is available. No. Okay. So January, I think you're um, finished with this section. I think we should take a five minute break and let people um, just move a bit. Is that, are we on time for a break right now? I think we are. Um, I think we had uh, establishing criteria for the benchmark and then a break and then Michael launching into benchmark methodology. But I'm, you know, we can take a break now if you think that's, that's good. We're yeah, sort of an actually hour to what I would, what I'd like to suggest if I can is we're at time for public comment. This is our 10 minute public comment period. And then we're scheduled for a 15 minute break after that, which you can shorten to five minutes. I have, I have no problem with that. But um, if we could, if you could call for public comment now and we could wait for that and then, and then take a brief, brief break and pick up the topics again, that would be great. Thank you. I knew we had something scheduled. Well, you're All on right. it. So, um, as Annalisa has just pointed out, now's the time for public comment. Anyone wishing to provide public comment, please state your name and affiliation before speaking. And um, if you'll take yourself off of mute and um, announce who you are. And we'll just give this a minute or two. If you are uncomfortable with that too, you can certainly um, type something in the chat and we will call on you. Hi, Sue, this is Abby Cook with uh, CNSI. Hi, Abby Cook. Thank you for um, announcing yourself. Go ahead with your comments to the board. Sure, it's really a question and it may be that I um, am still learning, but as currently defined is the out-of-pocket cost for uninsured individuals and families captured in this set of data. Abby, thank you for, Abigail, thank you for that um, question. I'm gonna turn to Michael or January um, to try to answer that for us. Um, yeah, I can answer that. Um, it is not captured. Um, okay. There's not really a good source of uh, data for capturing any these costs, these costs for uninsured for people. Um, it is it is a limitation of the way of um, the data essentially. Sure, that makes sense, January. I wonder if we have a sense of the magnitude of that that piece of the spend that we're not able to, to capture, to get the details of. So there's one state that we're working with that's looking at that. Now, remember a lot, I mean, you're aware of this, a lot of the serving of the uninsured is a cost for providers, but it's not a source of revenue, but it is to some extent, right? So some people who are uninsured are paying something for services. Uh, in Connecticut, we've been um, talking with the, um, the Health Center Association, which collects um, revenue information for uninsured patients for half of their health centers about sharing that information. And we suspect that hospitals would have it, but it's really um, patchwork because of course there are other providers who are also serving people who are uninsured and there's really no way of collecting spending by those individuals. Uh, that's the only state that's attempting to do something even to roughly estimate it. I think the other states have concluded uh, per the comments from January that there's simply no complete and reliable means for even estimating what type of spending is being done by people who are uninsured. So Abigail, thank you for that question. And I think what we'll do is park that issue for further discussion, but I appreciate you bringing that up. 
All right. Was, are there any other um, folks on the line that would like to make public comment at this time? All right, Annalisa, I think we have um, asked and I think we only had our one question. So do you wanna right. move? five minute break and then we'll come back and work on the uh, establishing criteria for choosing an economic indicator. I think that sounds great. So the time to be back in your seat is 1031, just enough time to make a cup of coffee. All right, everybody take a stretch break, get that coffee and be right back. Thanks all.
Annalisa, I see you've refreshed on your coffee. It's just enough time, man. My curing could not go fast enough, but I'm ready. Just uh, let me know, Annalisa, when you want me to get that started. Okay, well, I'm looking at, um, we have our participants. I mean, of course, everyone's online. I was just gonna take a brief look and see if it looks like, yeah, it looks like the majority of us. Yeah, I think. Um, let's reward people who are on time and get started. <laughs> okay. If you're okay with that, too. Yeah, absolutely, let's get going. All right, so, so we are now getting into the heart of things, which is the me benchmark methodology. Um, which is really like the main charge for this body. Um, so um, when we, we talk about establishing the cost growth benchmark methodology, what we're really talking about is um, identifying the economic indicator or indicators um, that the, the value of the benchmark will be pegged to. And so um, why use an economic indicator? Um, well, the, the easy answer is that in Washington's case, the statute actually requires it. Um, the, the legislation says that part of the board's charge is to quote, select an appropriate economic indicator to use when establishing the healthcare cost growth benchmark, uh, end quote. And so indirectly um, in laying out the board's responsibilities, the statute kind of basically implies that the benchmark um, needs to be pegged to an economic indicator. Um, but, you know, but even if it wasn't required, um, the, the reason that states generally look to economic indicators um, comes down to, to why they're trying to set a cost, cost growth benchmark um, in the first place. Um, it, it's because costs, uh, healthcare costs more specifically have been growing at um, unsustainable rates, uh, much faster than inflation and income. And as a result, uh, spending on healthcare is taking up a larger and larger proportion of state budgets, uh, potentially crowding out spending on other priorities. And, and, you know, um, consumers are also having to spend more of their income on healthcare. And so the, the notion is that um, high and rising healthcare costs are hurting consumers and hurting the non-healthcare economy. And the goal is to try and make it so that um, healthcare costs don't, don't continue to outpace growth in other measures of um, consumer or economic well-being. You know, so, so states use an economic indicator as the basis for um, a benchmark to, to create that sort of linkage between healthcare spending growth and, um, and, and consumer and state economic well being. So, um, uh, in, in a little bit, in a few minutes, um, Michael is going to present you with some options for economic indicators to use as a basis for setting the benchmark methodology. And um, as you consider these options, um, there's really no right or wrong answer. Um, it's a matter of preference and what makes sense to you uh, and what message you want to send in establishing a healthcare cost growth benchmark. But you know, we thought that to guide the, the, the discussion and, and your decision-making, um, it would be helpful to first develop some criteria for choosing an economic indicator. So, so we have three suggestions. Um, the first suggestion is to choose an economic uh, indicator that would provide a stable and therefore predictable benchmark. And by predictable, um, I mean something that, um, you know, the benchmark isn't kind of kind of jump around from year to year, but rather people will know what it will, what it will be ahead of time for some period. Um, the second criteria, criterion we offer is that um, the indicator rely on um, independent objective data sources with transparent calculations. Um, so that means a methodology that is open and known rather than some sort of, um, you know, uh, formula that's sort of, you know, a black box formula that, that uh, no one but the creator uh, knows, knows how to calculate. Um, and then the third criteria 
we suggest is um, choosing an economic indicator that will lead to lower healthcare spending growth, which is the whole reason for implementing a benchmark program to begin with. So um, how do these criteria resonate with you? Um, are these the criteria that you want to guide future discussion on how, um, on how to choose an economic uh, indicator? And are there other criteria um, that you wish to consider? Let's open it up now for your thoughts. Board members, any discussion? Sounds like we're in agreement mm -hmm. about these uh, criteria. Are other states modifying or adding an addition, any other additional criteria that we're not thinking of? So, yeah, no, these were this, um, I think Oregon used the first two and then the last, which is a to lower healthcare spending growth was an addition made by Connecticut. I'm comfortable with all three of these criteria. How about others? Either I am as well. Thumbs up or smiles or head shakes or yeah. So I think this is I, I do have a comment. I have a comment. I guess when we're at point three, it's explicitly saying lowering healthcare spending growth. So let's just say hypothetically, you know, whatever benchmark we choose, and um, you know, would be like some inflation. Um, I'm just kind of looking at the slide, some inflation measure or some um, CPI based measure. What if sort of expected costs based on those metrics are um, just allowing for might um, predict sort of an acceleration of healthcare growth for um, for whatever reason. For example, if we ex we expect higher inflation in subsequent years, that would seem sort of inconsistent with that point three. If that makes sense. Yeah, this so I, guess I also actually had a similar concern also, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, when I saw it, I, I had thought to the inflation um, expectations coming up probably over the next few years will be probably such that explicitly saying lowering um, it, it's like the absolute end point is a little bit um, assumptive. <laughs> I don't know yeah, if that's yeah. a word. Um, yeah. Sorry, Bianca. I was, I was going to say, I think just because yeah. we have a benchmark doesn't, doesn't guarantee that the benchmark will yeah. be in support of lower healthcare spending growth. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Edwin. I, I was agree. wondering that myself too, Bianca, is um, are we looking for something that credibly portrays the impact of healthcare spending? I think you're looking to impact healthcare spending, right? You're using the benchmark as a means to influence healthcare spending. I would say it's almost to bring it a, a line that, that can help align health spending growth to more reasonable um, rates that we would expect. And this is all assuming that, uh, I mean, I haven't actually seen data that necessarily shows that our spending is faster than um, some other benchmark at the moment, right? I mean, so in some ways we're, we are actually trying to figure that out exactly where our spending is, right? No, no. <laughs> so, Bianca, I would, I would argue that um, if we don't begin to put downward pressure and send signals um, to the system in the macro environment of we've got to get the growth under control, um, I think that we are uh, diminishing our duties. And I think that we would all agree that when you look at the acceleration and how we are crowding out um, other parts of the budget, that we would be remiss in not leaving number three in this as a criteria. Well, I don't think we, I, I don't disagree with you, Sue, about the goals and, and definitely the need to make sure that health spending is growing at a reasonable rate that is not, you know, accelerating for sure. It definitely needs to decelerate. 
Um, it's just that I, th I think the concern that like Edwin Edwin was bringing up initially is this challenge that especially uh, general economic indicators that we may be matching to, especially over the next few years may not necessarily result in lowering. We have to just be careful about um, the, I think the goal of this activity is to lower or at least reduce um, or slow down the health spending growth. But um, the benchmark just, it, it's, it may be a challenge, that's all. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I actually liked number three. Um, I, I appreciate your remarks, Bianca and Edwin, but I, I feel like the the purpose of this is, is this is not an academic exercise to you know it, it is the reason we are here is to lower healthcare spending growth and even the way it's it's worded is fairly modest I would I would be I'd be comfortable going further lower I taking growth off there and just lower healthcare spending but I think this is a probably better more responsible way to say the third one but i'm very comfortable with keeping it i don't know how other people on the board feel it seems like we paused long enough to identify an area of controversy <laughs> i think that uh what we mean is we want to lower health care spending growth from what it would otherwise be if we were not involved in this activity so we want to influence the growth in health care spending but I, that's too complicated so i'd be happy with number three as it's written that was my question was that you just hit on margaret about lowering it compared to what it would otherwise be or was projected to be including inflation effects versus lowering it from what it has been there, there, those are you know, potentially two different, those are different ways of um, targets, right, um, to aim at. So I would just appreciate clarification, um, making sure we understand the simple statement, number three, um, what do we exactly mean? Lower it compared to what it was already trending to be or lower from what it has been. It's been so, two, been four percent. We want it under four. So, Kim, it, at least where they introduced this in Connecticut, they meant um, to lower it from what it has been in the past. Yeah. The so-called flattening of the curve. That's what they had intended, especially because it's very difficult to know um, what it will be or what it would have been in the future, <laughs> if not for this. And I think the notion is that, you know, if healthcare spending growth has been on average 5% over the last, I don't know, five years, eight years, then you're not going to choose a benchmark that's 8%. <laughs> I think that's sort of the, the, the notion around this, this criterion. Right. I think hence Edwin and Bianca's comments. Mm -hmm. If it if the, the there will be pressure there there you know could very well be inflationary pressure that works against achieving the lowering compared to what it has been. I mean, is is that a simple way to say what what you were raising, Bianca? Yeah, and actually, I think the way January just put it, I think, helps me maybe understand perhaps what the. Um, what this criteria helps to do, which is to say, you know, when we look at potential economic indicators, and if we're seeing that they are growing at, say, 8%, and that is not a goal of ours. So say if the local state gross state product is, for example, is a metric that we look at, and that is growing at 8% for whatever reason. And that's not counter to, you know, where our health spending growth rate is or where we want it to go. That should not then be the measure we pick because the goal is to find a growth rate that is aligned with something that brings it down and not up. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I can buy that, yeah. So are folks in agreement then with, um, with these criteria? Okay. 
see a lot of heads shaking and some thumbs up. Okay, good. Anybody, anybody, uh, let's just ask, is there any dissent about these? Do people feel like they can live with that third one in? Okay. We're All right, so I will then uh, turn it over to Michael. Thanks, January. All right, this is the meatiest part of the agenda. You will have lots to say here, I guarantee. Uh, and we will go as far as we can in the time that we have allocated and, uh, and wherever we end, we'll pick up at the next meeting. So what I am going to do is to share with you a menu of options for economic indicators that could be used for the cost growth benchmark. This is not an all-inclusive list, meaning if you've got write-in candidates, you are welcome to introduce them. Uh, I would say uh, probably after we've gone through this uh, list of five. Uh, I'm gonna go through them sequentially. I wanna note uh, just before we step into this that observationally, uh, you can categorize these five, I think into three groupings. Um, the first one is about um, economic growth within the state. The next couple are really about personal finances and the last couple are about inflation. Okay, so um, we're presenting them to you um, uh, because all of them except for the very last one are, um, are indicators that have been considered in other states and to some degree incorporated, although um, it varies. Uh, the last one is a Washington specific indicator and we'll explain why we're talking about it a little bit later. Any questions? Okay, so for each of the indicators, um, we're going to, uh, or I'm going to describe three things for you. Uh, one is, uh, how was the measured used? Um, I, I was, when I was preparing for our meeting today, I was looking at our language that says, what each of these indicators measures in the real world. And I was thinking, does that indicate that we're not in the real world today? I don't think so. Um, but, but we want to talk about how is the measures used outside of um, our setting. Uh, two, we want to talk about what it would mean for you to adopt the indicator uh, in terms of the messaging that it sends to the greater public. Because each of these indicators has, you know, carry some meaning and interpretation with it. Uh, and that's something for you to be cognizant of. And then finally, we're going to sh share with you actual performance data for um, the individual measure using both, um, although it varies a little bit, but generally speaking, um, using both uh, Washington specific historical data and US data. All right? So, option number one. Um, these are not presented in any particular order, just so you know, um, is uh, rate of growth in the uh, state's um, gross state product. So this is the state version of GDP, uh, and it's measuring economic output from the state. So all goods and services produced over a year and how much um, they grew. It's calculated in much the same way the GDP is calculated for the US as a whole, not exactly the same, but um, for our purposes, just know this is a measure of um, economic output within the state. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, GDP or GSP at the state level uh, is a, a very common reference point to tell us how is the economy doing? And so if we were to use um, GSP, um, we would be saying healthcare spending in the future shouldn't grow any faster than the economy. Now we know that over time, frankly, over the entirety of my career, it's been growing faster than the economy, right? Which is why we have this reference point, healthcare as a percentage of GDP, and that percentage has been climbing over time. That's because it's been growing faster than the economy over time, which is why the share of healthcare of the economy has been growing over time. So um, that's that's the message if you were to pick um, the gross state product uh, as um, a basis for setting the value of the cost growth benchmark. The next slide shows um, what um, 
uh, gross state product and gross domestic product in, in Washington, the US have looked like going back to 2000. Those gray vertical bars are periods in which we went through a recession. Uh, and so you can see the dips there. What's most notable is that since 2012, and really to some extent uh, going back to 2004 or five, uh, the economy in Washington has been growing uh, sizably faster than the US. Uh, and uh, in the last several years, it's very much been the case. Okay, so high levels of, I'm, whoops, I'm not ready to go. <laughs> so, um, and I want to note, you're going to see in some of the other economic indicators that this is um, a frequent pattern that um, economic growth and income in uh, and inflation in Washington have tended to be higher than the U.S. Uh, when we look back over 20 years, uh, not every year, uh, but but that is a trend that we see. So let me pause now and uh, and ask you if you've got any questions about what looking at change in per capita gross state product means. And and actually, while you're pausing to think about whether you have questions. I want to note that in all of these graphs, when we show data to you, um, we are showing you nominal values. Okay, nominal means these are the actual rates of growth. We are not adjusting for inflation. And the reason we're not adjusting for inflation is because when we measure spending, we're not adjusting for inflation. So we, we need an apples to apples comparator, which is why we're using the nominal values on all these graphs. So any questions about any of these slides? what it means. So Michael, can, can I just ask, um, just in, as we think about how we pick a benchmark and think about health spending. So when, um, uh, if we cho chose this and we looked at say 2018 spending for healthcare, we would look at the fact that in Washington state that spending was, uh, overall spending in the state was 9%. So would we say that we would uh, restrict health care spending in 2019 or 2020 to that 9% or how do you, how do you apply these benchmarks? Sure. So we're gonna talk a little bit later. You have, you have two choices to use forecasted values and use historical values. If you use historical values, you have to decide what's your time window going back. Uh, and generally when states use historical values, they use a long time window because you can see how up and down uh, the economy has been. And this is true of every state. This isn't Washington specific. Uh, and so if you pick a very short time window, you're going to get a, a, a highly distorted event. I mean, just think if, if you pick 2020 and what went on in terms of economic disruption in the U.S. that year. So typically it with states use historical periods, they look at periods of 20 years or so, which is why we're showing you 20 years of data on this slide and on some of the others. So like in this case, it's somewhere between say 5% or 4 or 5%. Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll, we will share with you the actual values later on. So you can see what it is on average. I would say that if you decide to go with the 2018 state level value, um, the healthcare industry in Washington would be very happy. No, I recognize that. That yes, <laughs> I, I definitely recognize that. That's why I was trying to understand, yeah, how how to take away the the points here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll note, you know, there also are techniques for doing smoothing um, that are frequently used, where you you take out, you know, those um, the super high points and the super low points. Um, I, there's no state that's done that, but that certainly is a methodology that can be used. Any other questions or comments? Okay, we can move on. So um, option two, uh, this is uh, one of two indicators that looks at personal finances. So rather than looking macroeconomic view here, we're looking at a very um, consumer oriented measure. And this is looking at changes in personal income over time. Uh, we've broken down personal income here, so you know what it means. So um, it's what you would expect, wages and salaries, um, but it also includes other forms of, of income. So employee benefits is included. And of course, the value of employee benefits, especially healthcare benefits, has been growing fast because healthcare costs have been growing fast. 
um, dividends, rent, and interest, and then transfer payments, both um, public transfer payments like Social Security and, and governmental benefits, but also um, employer pensions to the extent they still exist. So it's a, it's a broad view of income that takes in multiple sources, but not all sources. So you can see here, the last bullet says it doesn't include capital gains, but um, this is a, relatively speaking, a broad definition of personal income. The next slide um, lays out um, uh, uh, what um, this means, um, which I think the, our definition does, but also how it might be messaged. So um, the public would view this as saying, you board are recommending that healthcare spending grow um, at a rate no more than uh, what the income of state residents is growing at, okay? Which is a very different message than saying it shouldn't grow um, any faster than the total economy and shouldn't consume a greater share of the economy than what it's already consuming, All right? And I'm not, I'm not saying one of these is better or worse, they're just different. Uh, and so something for you to consider. Uh, the breakdown of personal income is presented in a pie chart on the next graph. So you can see in this definition of personal income, um, uh, almost two thirds of it is net wages, but property income and transfer payments are not insignificant contributors. Uh, and so this, re this really distinguishes this measure uh, from looking at just wages. Uh, because just wages would account for only 62% of this total value. Uh, the next graph um, slide has a graph, and you can see the difference here uh, between uh, Washington and the U.S. Again, Washington is above the U.S., but the differential is much, much smaller. Uh, and it's not true that consistently Washington is above every year, although since 2012 that's been the case. But um, we, we don't see the same spread in personal income as we saw for, um, for a growth of the economy. And again, it's, it's up and down um, with, um, with a big trough for the Great Recession um, between 2008 and 2010. Okay, third option is looking just at wages. So as a reminder, wages is a component of personal income. This is just compensation uh, for um, individuals. Uh, it does not include some of the income sources that higher income earners typically um, accrue. So that dividends, rents, and interest that was in personal income, that's not included here. And it's mostly higher income earners who generate that form of income. Um, capital gains wasn't included in personal income and capital gains isn't included here. And certainly capital gains is something that you find with higher income earners. Um, wages um, have grown slower than personal income because um, non-wage income has been growing faster, both because of um, the stock market that benefits higher income earners and because of the value of health insurance benefits, which have been growing much faster than wages. Next slide. So if you were to select um, weight change in wage um, over time as the basis for setting the value, here you would be focusing on, um, on people's paychecks more than in personal income. So again, narrower construction of, uh, of what personal finance means in this case. Related, but, uh, but there's a difference here. Uh, I, I will note, by the way, that in, um, in the graphs that we're sharing with you here, we're sharing with you the, um, the mean uh, values. Uh, there have been some states that have attempted to and have adopted median values. And the median values for these income indicators look different than the mean values because in the United States, um, it's higher income workers whose income has been growing faster and lower income workers less so. And so if we looked at this uh, and we showed median instead of mean, 
we would have a lower trend rate. And that's because of the phenomenon I just described. Okay, um, so let's go forward a couple of slides. So this slide, nope, not there, the one with the graph. It's uh, 36, there it is, 36, now 37, 36. Thank you. So uh, this depicts the variation in uh, wages by county in Washington. And there's quite a bit of variation as you can see in this color coding. Uh, I wanna know two things. One is um, uh, Washington ranks pretty high among states in average wage. Uh, but I wanna note that for those parts of the state where wages are significantly lower than in the parts where they are high, uh, uh, a faster um, faster growth in healthcare spending is going to impact um, individuals in those geographic regions and people with lower income, even in the higher income regions, um, to a greater extent than they it is for higher income people. So if you're making six figures and your health insurance expenditure goes up by 7%, that's going to impact you less than if you're making $35,000 and it goes up 7%. That's the only point I wanna make is that, uh, you know, there's, there's differential impact um, uh, in the population, even though we are looking at these numbers on a total population basis. Okay, and here you see a graphing of wage growth. Um, as with personal income, it's much tighter to the US rate, except the last few years. There's a real difference between wage growth and personal income growth in Washington the last few years that frankly looks a little strange to me, um, especially 2018. That's just an enormous gap between the US and the state. I don't know how to explain that, but, um, but otherwise um, the, the graph here is, um, is tight to the US average relative to what we saw for state economic growth where there was a bigger gap. Okay, next slide. So the last two, actually, let me pause. Any question about those personal finance focused measures as a group? I'm wondering what the source of your information is. Okay, so they're all um, footnoted on the bottom and they vary based on the indicator. So you can see this one comes um, from uh, the Washington State Office of Financial Management. And you should see similar sources on other slides. Yeah, I'm just wondering where they get it in that we don't have an income tax. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Anybody else know how the state gathers wage information? I don't know that answer, Michael, but I am hearing you say that the um, category of kind of personal wealth, all of these um, metrics really have to be looked at through an equity lens. Well, I'm saying there are equity implications. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So back back to your comment on obviously it impacts somebody at a lower wage. Do we know what the average out of pocket was per per person? Uh, we don't have that information today. Um, I can tell you, John, though, it, it just as a, a point of information that might interest you. Uh, in uh, Connecticut, they've done some mining of their all pair claims database, and they looked at trend for um, commercial medical spend. And then they looked at trend for commercial out-of-pocket spend. The commercial out-of-pocket spend was three times what the medical spend was. Okay. So um, consumers in, with commercial policies have really been taking it on the chin in terms of healthcare expenditures. And that doesn't even speak to premium. That's just the out-of-pocket coinsurance deductible spend. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, 
So let me talk about the last two options. Um, they are both um, inflation related measures. Inflation looks at changes in prices over time uh, and uh, how much uh, buying ability consumers have. There are two that we're going to talk about today, um, CPI and the U.S. implicit price deflator, which you may not be familiar with. Let's start with CPI, which you probably know. Um, CPI, or consumer price index, is a commonly used. There are actually multiple versions of CPI. The one that is used most often is referred to as CPI All Urban or CPI U. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it captures prices for 94% of Americans, uh, which I would say includes a lot of non-urban areas. Uh, this is looking at price changes for retail goods and services, not all goods and services, retail goods and services. Uh, so this is focused on, uh, again, what consumers can buy with their dollar. Uh, and uh, there are some people who question, well, why would we look at CPI when looking at healthcare expenditures? Because um, healthcare is not just price, but it's also the volume and intensity of services, not just their prices. And the rationale for looking at CPI is that for consumers, um, healthcare often does equate to a price. It's the price of a premium or it's the price of a, of a service that might be purchased from a healthcare provider. So um, while those in healthcare say, well, you know, total healthcare spending is both price and volume, through a consumer's lens, it can be viewed as price. Next slide, please. So there's a, a separate measure of inflation that we want to talk about. It's got a very long name, implicit price deflator for personal consumption. Uh, and uh, this is a different way of looking at inflation. Uh, it's essentially um, looking, taking the nominal GDP and dividing it by the real GDP and multiplying by 100. So it's looking at what's the difference between um, nominal and real GDP. And so it, it is uh, imp uh, implicitly um, looking at changes in price much more broadly because as we talked about earlier, GDP is the totality of all goods and services produced in the economy, where CPI is a retail basket of goods and services. So it's retail and it's a basket, meaning it's a selective list. The reason that we are sharing this with you is uh, Washington State makes a lot of use of this uh, for its state expenditure limit, for inflation adjustments, uh, property tax increase caps. They're all linked to the implicit price um, deflator. Uh, this is not a measure that other states have considered, but because it's in such active use in Washington, we wanted to share it with you. Next slide, please. So if you decided to use inflation uh, as the basis for setting the benchmark value, you would be saying um, that you think that uh, healthcare shouldn't grow any faster than other prices that consumers experience, either uh, retail prices in a market basket or the prices of everything in the whole economy as roughly measured through the implicit price deflator. The next slide um, graphs out what these look like. This is busy because um, as you will um, see here, we've got separate um, CPIU for um, Seattle, Tacoma, Bellevue um, and for the uh, West region of the US. Uh, here, as in all the other slides, we can see that in recent years, there's a gap between Washington and the West and the US. So uh, inflation's been a full point higher in, um, in Washington, really going back to 2015, than it's been in the rest of the country. And that's, that's pretty parallel to what we saw for uh, GDP growth. And this is graph the change in the implicit price deflator. You will note here that the percentage values are much lower for the implicit price deflator than for um, it was for CPI. So for example, um, we could see that between 2012 and 2019, it was bouncing between a little over zero and 2%. 
uh, January. Can you go back one slide? So, yeah. So here, if we look at, whoops. <laughs> Michael, the next slide compares the oh, CPIU. Oh, thank you. I forgot that. IPD. All right. Yeah. So, all right. So you can see the difference here. I forgot that we had them on one slide. Uh, so CPIU is much higher than the implicit price deflator um, for the last several years. All right. I, I will note um, the implicit price deflator is not um, a, uh, a well understood concept. And so while it is a measure of inflation, if you ever were to select it, uh, you probably would want to just refer to it as inflation and not the implicit price deflator, or you would lose um, any lay people who were trying to follow what your recommendations were. All right, any questions or reflections on the two inflation measures? I have a question on the consumer price index the retail services that are out of pocket by consumers, would that include any medical expenses? Yeah, it, I, think, it, I think it does. There is separately a medical CPI, which we're not sharing here. The medical CPI is always higher than CPIU because medical prices have been growing faster. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so there's, there's, um, there's a little bit of conflating going on here if you're using uh, medical prices. Uh, we had someone else in another state ask this question maybe a year or so ago. I think we found out, Lois, that the, the contribution of healthcare prices to CPIU um, was not great, and we didn't feel that it really compromised CPIU. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Bianca, I was uh, looking at the into that question about where does OFM get their wage information because that, that was a good question in terms of since we don't collect state income tax, um, where would that information come from? I was looking at OFM's website and they then point to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is a national organization, but I can't actually figure out where it, they got it out of that agency. And so I'm wondering, I, I know another source is the Occupational Employment Statistics, which is a national source of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they do have state level information going back many years. So just on this question of like sources, do we have much say in the sources? I mean, I think OFM is definitely one source and it's probably one that we can go to and ask more questions about how they calculated that number. Uh, versus say another just as well recognized, but I know very transparent data source that comes out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics out there, OES. There are some trade-offs probably in terms of how they collect that data. I know the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics one is kind of based more on a survey than actual data. So I, I'm just curious about the actual source um, and, and how that's considered in this process. Bianca, you all can use whatever you want. Right. We're presenting you with choices, but we're not limiting you in any way. Uh, if you would like us to do some work to figure out how the state gathers the data and whether they're relying on federal sources and if so, which ones and are they survey or non-survey based, we can look into that and come back to you. Um, generally, when there is a national versus a state source, we have tended to use the state stores because in 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 our past work, that's what states have preferred. But it you know, we can use either or. Yeah, I mean, I just when I was looking at the uh, OFM's website, they just kind of point to a website, another website that I, I'm familiar with, but I just I just don't know what that ultimate source is. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll just put that link here. Yeah, we can, we can do a little research yeah. and let you know. Yeah. Uh, and we can let you know whether the values are any different between the two sources that you've cited. And I'll put the other source in here. Great. I'd like to share that um, at Department of Labor and Industries um, that for our actuarial purposes, that we receive extensive wage data from the um, Employment Security Department. So- yeah. And they're the ones who pull from the occupational employment statistics out of um, Bureau of Labor Statistics. So that's the other source. I would think that's helpful to hear actually. So Michael, do, do you have any information that similar to this graph that actually puts 
Washington State economic growth with personal income wage growth with these two uh, inflation metrics. So we had, it, it appears to me that economic growth has been the highest. It looks like wage growth has been higher than CPI growth, but I'm having a hard time kind of wrapping my head around. <laughs> We're going to help you wrap your head around it, John. Yeah, we we have a table later on where we can show you the values. We purposefully have not shared that with you yet because we'd like you to have a conceptual conversation before you pick something based on the values. We'd like you to think through sort of the messaging and okay. does it feel right to use economic growth or personal income or inflation and what are the pros and cons of those? So that's where we want to go next. But we do have, uh, we've got a couple of things we can share. What are the values of all these indicators, um, both looking backwards and looking forwards? And we also can share with you what's been the healthcare um, trend for Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial over the last several years. All right. So we're going to give you every data point that we can think of that we think would be helpful to you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Okay, so this is that conceptual conversation that I said that we wanted to invite you to have. So um, we've, in, we've given you five options for your consideration and um, we've identified some pros and cons. It's not a, a fully inclusive list for these options. And we'd like you to think through whether any of these indicators is particularly attractive or not attractive to you and why. As I said earlier, these are not all the economic indicators. So if um, you have a writing candidate that you wanna introduce, um, you know, here's where you can do so. But these are the ones that we thought were uh, deserving of your consideration. So we're going to go through a, a conceptual conversation and see if you can develop a rationale for tying the benchmark to one, or I would say more of the indicators. We, uh, we have a, a couple states that we've worked with that actually have, have found interest in, uh, in two indicators. So uh, certainly you can do that too. So, um, you all uh, might be wondering how can we figure out how to set the value without knowing historical spending growth. And uh, as I just indicated in response to John's question, we're gonna share with you the values of these indicators and of historical spending a little bit later on. Uh, and uh, we might get to that today or we might uh, do that at the beginning of the next meeting, depending upon how quickly a pace we move. Right, so I just wanna remind you about what the other states have done now that we've looked at these. So um, the first three states to set um, cost growth um, benchmarks were Massachusetts and Delaware and then Rhode Island. And Massachusetts um, selected the potential growth state product, which is a forecast of um, gross domestic product or gross state product. Okay, that's what potential gross state product means. It's, it's a forecasted value of the state economy. That's what Massachusetts picked, and they picked it because it's in their statute. <laughs> so, um, so the the Health Policy Commission didn't really have any say because that was the legislation that was negotiated. And um, and to be honest, uh, Delaware and Rhode Island said we'll do the same thing. Massachusetts must have known what they were doing, so we'll do the same thing. Um, uh, Oregon was a little more independently thinking, and uh, they also had some other uh, contextual factors to consider. So they um, they considered historical gross day product, not a forecast, and historical median wage data, not mean, but median wage data. Um, and they also considered the fact that their Medicaid program operates under an 1115 waiver that has a per capita growth cap built into it. Uh, and that per capita growth cap was also um, applied to their state employee um, health program by their legislature. 
in the end, they didn't specifically tie their cost growth benchmark to any one of these indicators, but rather they considered um, the three sets of values, the historical economic growth, historical mean wage data, and these uh, growth caps that have been applied to the Medicaid program and state employee health plan. And that's how they got to their indicators, to their um, benchmark. And then finally, Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut did uh, a uh, 2080 blend of two forecasted figures, potential gross state product and median income. Uh, so um, three different approaches. You don't have to do any of these, but we just want you to, for context, to know uh, what these five states chose to do. All right, so this table um, lays out all the options that I've walked through. Uh, again, as I said, these are not all of the pros and cons of the indicators, but let me review at least some of them and you can add your own uh, and then we can talk about the relative merits. So uh, gross day product, uh, again, the, the forecasted version of this is um, potential gross day product. Uh, this is used by um, a number of other states. And so you might see value in having consistent policies, although as I noted, not everybody's got it. Um, it's, a, it's a somewhat um, abstract economic concept and certainly for um, citizens or consumers, it's not going to resonate as well uh, as some of the measures that are tied more to their personal financial experience. Um, I will say though that, um, you know, th there, this goes back to the advantage column, but some people um, like gross state products because they like the idea of trying to um, view healthcare spending growth in the lens of the portion of the economy that healthcare consumes and generates uh, at the same time. Uh, personal income um, recognizes that income is more than just wages. You saw that about 40% uh, of income was non-wage based and that was without capital gains. Um, it uh, relative to wages is gonna give you a higher indicator uh, because non-wage income has been growing faster for higher wage earners. And you might not want to have a measure that is um, lifted upwards by um, those who are more economically advantaged. Um, average wage, the, the attractiveness of this is um, the, the average citizen understands what this means. This is what I'm taking home from work. Um, but uh, it doesn't recognize that there are a whole bunch of other forms of income, which is what number two gets at. Uh, inflation um, treats healthcare as an expense, much as consumers may do, as I indicated earlier. Um, but you know there are a couple weaknesses here. One is we know that that service utilization drives spending, not just price, uh, and um, there is no longer a Washington-specific measure of CPIU. Uh, and so going forward, we would have to use a, a, a regional one. And then the implicit price deflator, um, strength of this is the state uses it for a lot of other things. Uh, the weakness is um, uh, nobody will understand what it means. <laughs> I would say that. Um, also, it's not a Washington specific measure. It's calculated using national GDP, not state GSP. All right, so um, that's your, um, your uh, intro class to economic indices. I hope you feel a little bit educated from having gone through that. And now on the next slide, I'd like to put the question to you. Um, do any of these indicators on a conceptual basis, not knowing exactly what the value is and not knowing what historical spending growth has been, do any of them seem appropriate to use for uh, determining the benchmark value. I'll venture uh, a thought. Um, I think what I struggle a little bit is a little bit about who's spending we're really considering. So for total spend, I can understand that maybe when you look at those purchasers and the providers and they look at the health spending, they're going to consider the cost of labor, the cost of goods and all those things. And so they probably like to see the health spending um, be allowed to grow 
kind of at some rate of the GSP. So I can understand that interest. You can see though, from a consumer's point of view, they're not going to recognize or appreciate all those pieces about labor and cost of goods and all those, and they're going to really focus on their out-of-pocket spend. And so they would like to know that at least their out-of-pocket part is not growing faster than their wages um, and, and or personal income. But I think those who are most concerned are those who are not having those additional transfer assets. They don't have that property income. They really are relying on their wages. And so the average wage is probably what individual citizens, which may be a bulk of folks who would grumble perhaps if we don't pick the right number, uh, you know, rightfully so, uh, that they, they will want to know that it's growing, that health spending is constricted to that. So what I struggle a little bit with is, and maybe this is the blend piece, is, is how to incorporate both um, kind of the needs of the providers and purchasers who are um, probably going to want that GSP uh, versus the citizens who are probably going to want to see the average wage as the benchmark. And I know that we're supposed to focus on total spend and think about that growth, but it would be great if we could figure out how to help limit the out-of-pocket growth piece that that's benchmarked to the average wage. That would mean that we would just shift more of the cost burden back onto the purchasers and payers, uh, pr purchasers and providers rather than the individuals. Yeah. So That's Bianca, you, you totally hit the nail on the head in terms of the different perspectives that you're likely to hear. Um, on your last point, which I think is something that's come up in our earlier meetings, um, there are no states today to date that have set a target or benchmark for out-of-pocket spending growth. Uh, but the data that we've seen, and I, you know, I shared with you the, that Connecticut story, and there's there's other information that affirms this, suggests that that the problem there is, is really profound for people with commercial insurance. So um, your charge, um, your statutory charge is to set the total benchmark, but certainly if you wanted to make a recommendation um, as it related to out-of-pocket spending growth, um, I, I, you know, I, I think you would have the ability to do that. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm, uh... I relate to Bianca's comments. Um, I'm mostly concerned about the vast number of people in the middle who have been uh, impact, impacted in both um, their share of the premium and um, co-payments and so on. And could we consider um, median wage? Because we have an awful lot of uh, people who make high wages, like tech workers, um, who will uh, skew things in terms of average wage. And Margaret, we went looking for median wage. I think January, we were unable to find, is that right? So we were unable to find it from publicly available um, state and national sources, um, and more specifically forecasted median wage. Um, and uh, I do know that it is available um, if you purchase from like a forecasting company like Moody's or IHS Market, right? Because we were able to get that, I believe, for Connecticut. But based on the data that was available um, through uh, Washington State, like the Forecasting Council, um, we were not able to get that. It's something certainly that we could consider and go out and get. January, I'm just posting from BLS's OES data set for Washington. They do have median wages, but it's not forecasted. It, That's it's right. a complex survey, but um, mm -hmm. it would require somebody to do that modeling clearly. Uh, yeah. And I, I assume that's probably outside of the purview. Well, so no, so you have options yeah. here. Um, so we haven't talked yet about using historical values versus forecasted, and we'll do that later. Right. But if you, if you strongly believed in using median values for income or wage, uh, then um, we have options for historical. It's for forecasting, you'd have to agree that it, you would be comfortable and supportive of using um, a commercially procured value from the forecasting vendors. That's all. Um, and there's nothing wrong in doing that. Um, every single state uses those uh, companies for doing forecasting. Uh, but I just want to clarify, that's what would be required. So for our conversation right now, I think it would 
just be good to know which of these indicators would you like? And if you're interested in personal income or, or wage, would you prefer median over average or mean? I, I think I'm tending towards median average wage and potentially some combination of that with the gross state product. Um, I like things focused more on our state specifically. And I like things that will, like Margaret brought up, all those tech workers that might have extras sort of eliminate that impact of the higher wage earners from people that may, you know, make a lot less. So I think the wage side of things more than the personal income is more effective at that. And I do like the median. Thanks, Lois. I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree a little bit. I kind of like the inflation component. Um, I think the wage issue gets very complicated. I you know, obviously the Medicaid population, and and I don't know exactly today what the threshold is to qualify, but the Medicaid population has no out of pocket. There's mechanisms in place to manage the Medicare population's out of pocket. Absolutely, do we have an issue with commercial? Um, through changes in benefit design. But personally, I think most people understand there is a, a an inflation factor that products and services do go up every year. I just feel like the income one's a little bit tricky. We saw the disparity in income, uh, you know, depending where you are in the state and how do you adjust for that. Um, anyways, it would be nice to have a more accurate inflation uh, calculation for Washington. I, I, I do agree with that, but, um, and I think gross state product, as you pointed out, it's a little bit abstract and I have no idea what the impact of a large employer, a Boeing an Amazon a Microsoft, if they start moving more into Washington or out, how big of an impact that that has or not, I, I have no idea. Just my two cents. But. Thank you, John. I said, well, just to follow up on that, you know, I think you know two potential options I, I put out. I, I like the GSP approach because it, to your point, it quantifies the or captures the quantity and, and the price effects. I, I think one caveat, you know, specific to Washington State, is and I, I don't know the numbers, but the GSP I would suspect might be sort of disproportionately leveraged or disproportionately influenced by a few firms um, like Boeing and Boeing and Amazon. So I think we might, those might be sensitive to, the GSP might be sensitive to, to sort of shocks like a Boeing, for example, as, as John was saying, sort of leaves the state. There might be you know, shocks in that GSP number. I think that there's some argument for the inflation measure as well in the sense that I think by choosing an inflation-based measure, what we'll be saying is that we're willing to pay the same price in, not, in in real terms, so in real purchasing power terms that we are sort of in the present, but allowing for um, allowing for this general general price effects, general um, inflative effects. And I think you know the, the limitation that he articulated, Michael, is that um, you know, it doesn't capture quantity effects. But I think you know one maybe tweak to that is maybe if we look at um, have an inflation benchmark, but do it. Um, in terms of a per capita spending rate, so um, spending per per Washington State resident, I think that might help alleviate some of the some of the quantity effects. Thanks, Edwin. Anybody else want to put some ideas on the table? We're developing a nice range. I have a I have a question. Um, so I, I actually liked what you you framed up one of the slides, Michael, saying healthcare shouldn't grow any faster than X. You know, I think that's a, a nice way to think about it. And um, I was, you know, looking at these. All of these are probably not um, growing as fast as healthcare. Um, is there a sense of a differential in terms of? Um, you know, we looked at our healthcare costs in Washington State compared to any of these indicators, which would create the most um, the most difference or the most clarity. Uh, so, um, I think it's fair to say that um, most of them are not growing anywhere near as fast as healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll also say, if 
Some of them feel conceptually more appropriate than others. And in the end, they yield a value that is in some way problematic. You can also add an adjustment, um, mm -hmm. right? So you don't, you don't have to literally go with whatever that value is. Um, you could, I'm just making this up. You could say, we're going to pick CPI plus two. Okay, if, if you decide that CPI was too low, and, and that's just a theoretical example. So know that, um, you know, that most of these have trended well below um, spending growth rate, especially in the commercial market where the trend has been the highest. Thanks. I'll share that my reaction uh, was that I resonated, uh, three of them resonated, uh, growth state product, average wage, and inflation um, IPD. I know that my, uh, my mind went to, uh, you know, the sort of hybrid split, you know, <laughs> middle of the road kind of approach. Oh, well, maybe we could actually, kind of like Oregon, you know, consider um, the, all three you know, or two or three. And then to, but not to be too wishy-washy, <laughs> to say that, you know, pick sort of weights. Um, and I don't know that it's a third, a third, a third, or what have you. But conceptually, it seems that there is an argument to a, bal a, a balanced approach. It, it, it has some appeal. Um, it may make I'm arguing with myself, it may make the messaging and the clarity harder. Um, although in some ways it may make it easier because we're accounting for, you know, we're explicitly considering the, the um, indicators that are focused, um, for looking through different lenses. It, 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 it shows that we're considering the, um, uh, from all these different vantage points, which which I think is a strength, you know, that uh, could be viewed favorably. Um, so if it doesn't get too complex, you know, to to consider um, more than one, then I, I know I had a leaning to that toward that. Thanks, Kim. This is Lord right. Kate. I think I had similar reactions as many others and that there are things as these stand alone that, you know, I don't like and that I do, um, which is why I think I was attracted to Connecticut's approach um, around a hybrid. I think just thinking about our charter and goal and some of our criteria, um, I'm, I'm really attracted to median wage. Uh, and I recognize that there might be value in some sort of balance with that as well that considers some of the other factors that come into play here. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Laura. Um, kind of, I'm in kind of like what she said um, that I, I like the hybrid approach from Connecticut. And I also like median wage a lot because of the the huge disparity of wages in our state because of the impact of the tech industry. All right, so I'm hearing so far um, interest in some type of a hybrid. Um, not everyone has said um, median wage should be part of it, but um, I, I'm, I think I'm hearing either median wage alone or median wage with something else. Um, the, the something else in Connecticut was gross state product. Um, I, I'd be interested for those of you who have expressed interest in median wage and would like to see it perhaps joined with something else, if you have particular interest in what the something else is. So when reading through the packet um, without this conversation previously, I was initially leaning towards the blend um, approach that Connecticut um, had and furthering the blend, which I think would, would really address many majority in our state in their circumstances, GSP, median wage and inflation, particularly IPD. 
what what would be your weight um, of the blend recommendation if those three components were were used? So, so there's there's no recipe here. Okay. It's really whatever feels right to all of you. When Connecticut got to their weighting, uh, it was after debate and lots of disagreement. And you can guess who at the table was pushing for what part should be weighted higher and what part should be weighted lower. Um, and you know they wound up with something that left. Uh, and, and I will note too, their, their body that was um, doing the debating was informed by a group like your plans and provider group. And so um, it, was, it was easier for them to get agreement in their body that looks like you, which is a, what I'll call a protected group where you don't have, um, you don't have all the vested interest sitting at the table. But it, at the vested interest body, um, they, boy, um, there was a lot of disagreement uh, on what to weight and how to weight it. So, um, but Carol, to go back to my initial answer, um, there's no one right way here. So I think you all should do what, what feels right to you. We will then um, perform the calculations and allow you to see what number does that yield. And then you can talk about, boy, does that feel right or not? And do we want to make any adjustments? Anybody else have any ideas who has, who has not spoken yet? So this is Sue. I just, um, I really like the hybrid approach. I worry that if Washington does not do some component of GSP, what does that do as, you know, the first eight start um, kind of comparing our work and maybe doesn't have any bearing on that at all. But my three favorites are the GSP, the median wage and the IPD inflation. And I know that that makes for a little tougher math, but I actually think it lends to a good story as we explain to people why we came up with that. Uh -huh. So we, we could model a couple of options to get you started. We could do one that looked at uh, GSP median wage um, and inflation where we weighted them equally. We could do another, or, and, and maybe show you a couple of different weighting schemes actually. And we could do another one that just looked at median wage and GSP, which is like Connecticut. And we could show you what that looks like and bring it back to you at the next meeting. I am concerned if we have to buy the median wage data and, it's, and if it's not readily available in our state, I, I don't want us to do anything that drives more cost into healthcare. I mean, that would be- It's dying. not expensive though. Okay. Um, so I just, I, I would like to understand that a little bit more or a proxy for median wage if we can't get that data. Yeah. Yeah, and if you want to use a forecasted value, I think it's possible to do that at pretty low cost. And, well, and think, I, I'm trying yeah. to connect dots on if, if really the goal is to try to get out of pocket in control costs to employers, you know, premiums, I get the, the average wage and inflation. I still don't know how to tie the GSP to that. I mean, I still don't know how to connect that dot. I mean, I understand what it is, but. Yeah, what's the logic for it? Sue, so, you, you wanna share your thoughts with John on why you think we should include GSP? Um, yeah, I, I actually think, again, it gives us um, the, economic position of what's happening in the state, but also it gives us that anchor to other states. It gives us that comparison. So I, I think it's important not to go. I'm really glad to hear we're not going off and creating um, a completely different metric that is so Washington specific. So I think it's important as we do this work across the country that we try to stay in the pack of others that are, yeah, I realize we're all doing this a little bit differently, but that's my rationale. Gives us those two pieces the economic climate for the state and also the link to the other state comparisons. Okay, well, this is our first go round. Um, we, we didn't plan on coming to closure on this today. So I think you've given us enough to, to give you something to look at at the next meeting. Um, we only have a few minutes left. And so I wanna try to have a brief conversation about 
um, using historical versus forecasted numbers and get your sense. So January, if you could race us forward, a couple slides. So um, as I've noted, um, states have done different things in terms of using historical experience versus forecast. More have used forecast than historical experience. Um, Oregon um, focused on historical experience. Actually, their state economist uh, <laughs> recommended that they do so. Uh, but we want to get your take on what you think would be best. So let me talk a little bit about the two options. Next slide, please. So historical experience, um, as we talked about earlier, you have to define how far back to look. Looking back longer helps to adjust for volatility. Um, it's, it's very easy though to calculate um, what the average historical growth has been um, or even do the median. Um, that's, that's not uh, hard mathematical work to perform. Um, forecast, whoops, can you go back? Yeah, trying, yep. Okay. There you go. So forecasts, um, there are publicly available forecasts and we've used some of them on the slides that we showed to you today. And then as January indicated, um, there are two major vendors um, that, that sell private forecasts and they are commonly used by state government. Um, we know exactly what the methodology is for the public forecast, the private forecast, not so much. Uh, and so there's some loss of transparency if you use a, a Moody's um, or an IHS. It's not HIS, but IHS. Okay, so those are the choices. Next slide. Um, when you use forecasts, you typically get very stable figures in forecasts. Um, historical data, you get the crazy up and down volatility. Um, now, this is real US um, GDP. So this is adjusted for inflation, um, what you see here. But in general, the forecast that you're going to get for real or nominal is going to give you a steady state value, which doesn't mean that it's giving you an act, a, a uh, accurate value, but it gives you a steady value. So that's, that's the difference of using the two approaches. The next slide shows the nominal version. Um, and I wanna note that in forecasts, when states have used forecasted values, they tend to use them for years five through 10 out and not one through five because years one through five can have some volatility to them. Uh, for right now, for example, anyone who's doing economic forecasting for the economy in the US is saying we're gonna have a big, um, a big spike of economic growth and inflation, and then it's going to drop back down within a year. So that's why they use years five through 10 out, because then you get um, less volatility. Um, if you want to use um, a forecasted value of gross state product, this is the PGSP that uh, Delaware, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island use, and Connecticut uses in part, uh, it's, it's possible to perform this calculation using publicly available data. Um, it's a mix of both national and state specific data to do the calculation. Um, it's not technically exactly forecasted gross state product, but, um, but it is a forecast of um, longer term economic growth, meaning years five through 10 into the future. Um, the next slide, um, depicts the differences in calculating GSP and PGSP. It's probably more than you want to know, but you could see on the right how potential gross state product or the, the forecasted version of gross state product that we would calculate is um, calculated. And this is, again, what um, the first three states use and what Connecticut's using in part. The advantages and disadvantages of historical versus forecasted. Um, historical, easy to calculate, but you got to deal with a great deal of volatility. Um, and it's not clear um, uh, exactly what time period to choose. The forecasted, uh, much more stable and predictable, uh, but there's also no certainty that, <laughs> that the forecasts are going to provide you with an accuracy um, and um, the Washington state forecasts that we were able to obtain only go out five years. Uh, so in all the other states, we were able to get values five through 10. We probably could get that if we went to one of the vendors, 
but the state forecasts only go out uh, years one through five. Okay, so, so those are the pros and cons. I, I'd love to get your read on whether you think it would be better to use historical values or forecasted values now. Anybody have an opinion? Hey, Michael, if I could just ask a clarifying question, I guess in our setting of a benchmark, if you can remind us, are we doing this to recalibrate on a five uh, on a year-to-year -year basis? Or are we doing something that we're going a benchmark that we're setting that's going to be set in stone for five straight years? Uh, so you're going to be setting it, I think, for multiple years, Edwin. We'll talk later about whether you want to have uh, a trap door that would give that would um, allow for resetting. But um, generally speaking, not generally speaking, in all cases, the other states have set them for four to 10 years. In some cases, they've created um, a, a means to reassess, um, but in, not in all cases. Yeah, I asked that because I think the answer to that sort of affects my, it influences what I would think would be better historical forecasting because I think you know, a 10 year forecast, I, I think we'd probably agree are, are, pretty, are pretty variable and, and who knows what the accuracy is. So I think with that in mind, you know, I would you know, sort of advocate and perhaps maybe there's some sort of mix we can do here again that you know, using some sort of historical long run sort of, and you mentioned some filtering approaches um, that might detect some sort of long run trend in growth historically. And maybe if there's a way to combine that with a forward looking component that sort of takes into account some potential shocks, like being, you know, I think we could pretty much acknowledge that there's gonna be inflation in the next few years, that that forward looking component might be able to account for that. I think that would be sort of an ideal situation if we could do that. So did I hear historical, but opportunity to revisit? Is that what you were? Historical, but also if there's a way to incorporate the um, forecast. Yeah, sort of a blend of the two. Yeah. So I mean, anything's possible. Uh, we're going to show you uh, probably in uh, today's meeting, but next time, what historical and forecast values look like for all these indicators. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Probably run out of energy and we've just about run out of time. So uh, what we'll do is uh, do a little modeling for you. We will give you both forecasted and historical versions of the two ideas that we talked about, the, the three indicator blend and the two indicator blend. Uh, and, uh, and we'll show you some real numbers next time and we'll iterate a little bit more. Hey, thank you, Michael. What what excellent timing you you got. I wasn't sure you were going to get that last bit when you started, but you did. Um, well done. Um, thank you, everyone. We're we as Michael pointed out, we're coming to a close. It's eleven fifty four. Um, um, I am responsible for wrap up and next steps before Sue adjourns. So the decisions and conversation that you've had today will be shared at the next meeting of the provider, uh, the advisory committee of healthcare providers and carriers, and they will give you their thoughts about the discussions that you've had. And um, of course, we'll start preparing for our next meeting. Um, I, I, I understand, I had always understood from Michael in January that they weren't sure, they didn't expect that you'd get through all of these recommendations today. So you shouldn't feel disheartened. We have our next meeting. Um, good work, everyone. Um, we made a lot of progress. So Sue, I'm gonna hand it over to you for adjournment, please. Yeah, so um, I just want to thank everybody. We did some good work. And again, don't be disappointed because we knew we were going to ha um, have to have time for good dialogue and discussion. Um, so we'll get through more the next time, but what great progress we've made today. Um, thank you again for attending. The recording and summary will be posted shortly on our website. And then lastly, I want you to mark your calendars. So the next board meeting is Wednesday, June 16th at um, 2 to 4 p.m. And great work today. And thank you to the staff and to our consultants for bringing us along. All right, this meeting is adjourned. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.